afternoon and welcome. Um, I think I know most of you that are on the call, but for those of you that I have not yet met, my name is Laurie Campbell. And as the Executive Director of the MVC Alliance, I would like to thank you for attending today's webinar titled, How Patient Advocates Can Help Make Clinical Trials Work Better for Everyone. Um, our guest speaker today is Deb Collier. Um, I wanna give a little bit of background on Deb uh, for those of you that don't know her. She is an individual member of the MVC Alliance. Um, she has been for the last couple years. She's very active currently um, on the executive group. Um, she's a member of the research task force and she's also on the patient advocate advisory group. Deb has over 20 years as a patient, 20 years experience as a patient advocate. She's focused on research and has expertise on the clinical development process. Um, she founded Patient Advocates in Research, and she's a strong collaborator and connector. She's worked for many years to ensure the voice of cancer patients is included in the design, development, and implementation of clinical trials. Um, we, the impetus for this webinar um, came about because the Alliance had a POG call recently um, to brainstorm ideas on removing barriers to clinical trials. And that session was facilitated by Ann Lozer. And as part of that, Deb participated on the call and she demonstrated um, a lot of subject matter expertise. Um, so she was asked to do this workshop so that she could kind of help uh, the rest of, up, rest of us up the learning curve. Um, the goal for today's webinar is to help Alliance members up the learning curve on everything related to the clinical development um, process. So that's the players, the process, the language, trends, and um, focus areas for better patient results. Um, the format for today's call, uh, it's scheduled to go for an hour. Um, 45, 50 minutes will be uh, Deb pre presenting and then 10, 15 minutes at the end for Q&A. Uh, to make it a bit more in interactive, we're trying something new. We'll, you'll see some polling questions that come up for the audience and we'd love for you to participate in that. Um, throughout the presentation, there's an opportunity to ask um, questions by using the Q&A box in the lower middle part of the screen. Um, we will also have time at the end of presentation for you to raise, uh, raise your hand and Dana can then unmute you and you can ask your question. Um, I also wanted to let you know that we'll be sending out a recording of this session uh, along with slides and resources tomorrow and we'll have it up on the Alliance YouTube channel later in this week. Um, so we're very excited to have Deb kind of give us her perspective um, based on years of experience as a patient advocate focusing on research and so that we can hear more about what she's hearing, what she's doing, what she's seeing, um, and what she's thinking as it relates to the world of clinical trial development. With that, I will pass the baton to Deb. Um, welcome and thank you very much for um, uh, hosting today's session. Well, thank you, Lori, I appreciate it. Um, and as Lori said, this will be interactive, but before I, I say a few words and give us the agenda, can you just, um, you used an acronym, Lori, it's POG, and I wanted to make sure people knew what that was. Uh, sure, Patient Advocate Advisory Group. Okay, thanks. So we're going to uh, go over an overview, as Lori said, of the clinical trial landscape, just to kind of make sure everyone has the context of what's involved in, in clinical trials and who is involved. Uh, we're going to go over the trends that are happening. There are lots of changes that are happening in the clinical trial uh, world that will hopefully help improve the process. And that's what some of us have been involved in for quite a while as well. In fact, some of us have been pushing for those changes. And uh, then how we as patient advocates uh, have been making a difference and can continue to do so. Before that, uh, Lori asked me to talk just a little bit about how I got involved. And for those of you who know me, you sorry about this, but um, I actually started uh, in uh, breast cancer uh, patient advocacy 
in uh, the early 90s, like really early, 91 actually, while, uh, while I was finishing up treatment for my first breast cancer. And I've had more than one and I've had some other things happen as well. But uh, I was an executive in a computer company at the time, met on the steps of the first Mother's Day rally, which is how we got started with breast cancer uh, activism with an um, amazing woman who started Breast Cancer Action in San Francisco. And, uh, and it kind of went from there. I started uh, Patient Advocates in Research in the mid 90s as a, an international communication network of patient advocates who are involved in other advocacy organizations, although you can be an independent advocate as well, uh, because we needed a place where we could come together and share ideas, issues, thoughts. Uh, we, we work on trainings and learnings together. So it's something at the end, if you would like, uh, you're, you're more than welcome to join. You just email me and we can talk about it. Okay, so with that, I'm going to move forward. And we're going to start with a polling question for you. So please get ready to answer the polling question as Dana brings the uh, screen up. We're going to ask, have you ever been a patient participant in a clinical trial? So it doesn't matter what your background is, if you've ever joined a clinical trial as a patient uh, or volunteer, please answer the polling question, yes or no. And then you need to be sure and uh, hit the submit button. We're gonna let this go for just a few seconds. Dana, are we polling? I'm not showing any answers on the poll, but we are polling. Okay. All right, since this is the first time we've used Oh, this, I'm getting answers in the, in the Q and A button. Right. Yeah. Okay, well, that's good. We okay. Can... Yeah, we can hold on to that, so that's good. Okay. So we're gonna let it go a couple more seconds, and then I will try to show the Q and A. Let's see if that works, okay. So we have yeses and nos. Yes, and we're not seeing anything on the screen. So this may not work, but thank you for answering in the Q&A. If you'd like to, oh, okay, yes. Yep. <laughs> so um, I don't know why the polling didn't work. We're gonna try it with another question here in just a second. Um, so Dana, why don't you go ahead and, oh, I can do that one. Okay, and I'm gonna do the, take the Q&A off. Oh, and now, Hold on a minute, I have to stop sharing and share again and see. Okay, it locked me out again. Hold on let's one just, second. Yeah, let's, let's go on to the next one and we'll yep, I'm, make sure if it works. I'm working on that. Okay. Okay. Can we see polling question two? Thank you very much. Um, so that's the, have you ever participated? Can you move on to the next one? Dana? This is, have you ever participated? Oh, in I'm sorry. Development? Right. Yes. So <laughs> Okay, that threw me a little bit, sorry. And now I'm seeing Thanks. lots of answers, so that's good. Okay, good. All right, so the polling seems to be working on question two. Thank you guys for bearing with us. But the idea is, here is, have you ever been involved in helping to develop a clinical trial protocol? Yes or no? And be sure and hit the submit button. And we'll go just a few more seconds. So apparently if you're on an iPad, the yes or no doesn't come up. So um, oh, okay. we're, we're trying something new. We appreciate you're giving it a go with <laughs> us and we'll learn to do it a little differently next time. It so. did come up on the iPad. So you're, you're not seeing it, Laurie, since you're a panelist, you're not seeing it. So that would be. No, I'm getting a message from Terry. A, a message. Uh, yeah. Okay. 
So if it didn't come up for you, feel free to put it in the Q&A. And let's go ahead and see the results. OK, so there are some people who have participated in protocol development, about 37% who are on the call. So thank you very much. We will now move forward. Oh, shoot. Hold on a minute. It did not allow me to do that again. But I think we have figured this out. So hold on a second. The joys of technology. Yes. Well, we it's, get an A for it's wonderful when it works. <laughs> okay. Can you see my screen now? Yes. Okay. So we thought um, I thought we would start with patient engagement. You know, there are many buzzwords around, and we hear patient engagement, patient centricity, patient focus, patient this, patient that. And the question is, what the heck is that? And does it really mean anything, or is it just kind of a term to make everybody feel good because you know patients are kind of like mom and apple pie? Or are there actually actions that companies are taking? that are different than has been done in the past and that they're actually engaging and involving the patient voice in the development of, of clinical trials. So that's one of the things that we're gonna talk about. And when I'm doing presentations, I normally ask this question and then wait for the audience, but you won't have the opportunity to do that. But this is, this is really important. So the question is, which statement is correct? Is it statement A or statement B? And I hope that all of you are answering that in your own head. And the true answer is B, the treatment fails the patient. Patients do not fail treatments. And yet that's what we hear all the time. And we need to stop doing that because it's actually inaccurate. And everybody I talked to and myself included felt at some point in their experience that they were treated as if they were their disease and were being blamed for their disease rather than being a person who has this illness that needs help and needs to have it taken care of. I bring this up because this is an example of how the mindset has been in medicine and in research. And if we're gonna be working together, things have to change. And there actually has to be a change in the way business is done and the business models that are used with companies and with academia as well. So now we're, I'm gonna, pass this back to Lori because we have a question for our industry partners and uh, Dana is unmuting you as we speak uh, but the question is here so Lori take it away great thanks Deb at this point we would like to open up the webinar to our industry partners uh, we have invited each of our partners um, that registered for the call to provide a one to two minute lightning round summary about how their organization includes patient engagement in drug development. So with that, um, Dana has uh, unmuted all of the industry partners and would invite you to, um, if you would like to say something today, this is your opportunity, so please feel free. Hi, this is Elise Beth Kaplan here from Novartis. Can you all hear me? We can, Elise. Thanks for joining us. Hi, everybody. I hope you're all safe and well. Um, the way Novartis has been um, engaging patients in drug development in large part um, over recent years has been by forming what we're calling a patient insight panel. Um, and basically another acronym or PIP. And Patient insight panels are simply our ability to engage a patient or patient advocate um, as a consultant um, under the term of one or two years for ad hoc consulting. Um, and what we've been doing on the global side of our organization, which is where a large majority of our research and drug development take place is engaging these patients or advocates to provide input early in trial design, protocol development, um, so we don't get too far in the process before we're asking for those insights. So we've systematized this across numerous disease states um, and our 
now looking to engage a similar patient insight panel on the US side, the side that I work on, um, to continue to strengthen and build those perspectives as it relates to drug development. So thank you for the opportunity. Hi, Laurie, this is Gisu. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Oh, wonderful. Um, I work with Daichi Sankyo, and I'm very happy to be on this call. Thank you so much for the opportunity to provide a little input on what Daichi Sankyo is doing. Um, so in the past couple of years since I've been with the company, our focus has changed uh, from just doing the studies without the input of patients to more of a patient-focused drug development where we bring patients insight into the organization early and often through patient advisory committees as well as sharing um, ways of re you know their insight into barriers that may exist for clinical trials and how to remove that access issue as well as how best to include the, their insights in improving the way our sites um, at the site level, it works for clinical trials. We've also included patient voice in our uh, preference studies as well as phase four study development to benefit the gaps in knowledge from the scientist perspective as well as from the patients. Um, so those studies are ongoing. And then at the site level for studies, we are actually looking at materials that will be provided to patients to utilize the input of the patient community to help better those materials um, for the site, as well as um, um, you know, um, side effect management issues as well. So I hope that's helpful. Yeah, thank you very much, Isu. Are there any other industry partners that would like to contribute to the conversation? Hey, Lori, I'm going to pitch it over to Rich Hutchinson from our clinical development team at Pfizer. Uh, Rich, are you on the line? Dana, is his line unmuted? I unmuted someone who's registered as Ricky. Is that correct? I'm not sure. I think it, there is the only R in here. I don't have another name. Oh, okay. Dana. Unless, he's on the, unless he's on the phone. Yeah, I'm not sure. Um, well, I, 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 I know that our clinical development team has a work stream and um, are working um, actively to include patient input in our clinical development program. So we're gonna be doing a lot of activities from clinical development as well as um, gaining patient input into some of the report backs that patients will receive after the clinical trial is complete. So from um, the very beginning of the clinical development process and through the end of um, you know, ensuring that patients get their data back as well as, you know, what the results of the actual trials are. Um, you know, we're trying to incorporate all the different aspects of, um, you know, patient input into um, various um, programs. So uh, we look forward to continuing to um, elevate that and make um, our engagement even more robust as we move forward. Great. Um, one question uh, came up, so that was uh, Beth Burnett speaking from Pfizer. Um, oh, sorry. Yep. Okay. Uh, and I just wanted to read um, one um, comment from an uh, individual member of the Alliance. Um, it's dear industry, unless you're involving patient advocates from the first glimmer of the idea for trial, you're missing the boat. Otherwise, it's just marketing. Thank you. And it's signed by the advocate. So uh, thank you for uh, that contribution. Um, there was one other question um, uh, that Deb, maybe you could answer um, later in the presentation, but who do the advocates interact with in industry? Program managers, researchers, leadership. I think that's probably covered on your who's who slide. Okay. And then um, 
lastly, um, another question came up and how do patients get involved with these programs? And maybe we can talk about that at, as, at the end as well. So with that, uh, are there any other industry partners on the phone that would like to share the good work they're doing in involving um, patients in the uh, clinical development process? No? Okay, Deb, I will pass back to you. Thank you very much okay. for participating. Great. And hopefully we will still have time for questions and discussion at the end so uh, we can get to that. Well, so we thought we would um, go through what, what clinical trials are about and kind of who's involved in this. There are many players involved in this and you can see um, Dana found this great graphic for us so we're, we're on the road. Um, Certainly, uh, it can start with, uh, actually can start in lots of different places, but it, they're expensive. And so we always have a funder or sponsor of a clinical trial. Often there's more than one sponsor, and that can include companies, it can include government. Uh, there is the National Cancer Institute, NCI, that has what's called the NCTN, which is the NCI Clinical Trials Network. Uh, and many of us have been a part of that. I was actually the first patient advocate in any of the clinical trial groups, and that started in 1994. So uh, there, are, there are a lot of us that have been involved in that now through the years. Um, also academia and some private foundations also can run clinical trials. So the, the sponsor can be uh, multiple sponsors and they can be from many different places. Then there are vendors that a lot of sponsors, especially companies, use. And those vendors are usually called clinical research organizations, or CROs. And they can cover anything from one little piece of the clinical trial to running the whole thing. And sometimes they even get involved uh, in the design process, in the getting the uh, clinical trial approved process, which is where the ethics boards come in. An IRB stands for Institutional Review Board, this one down here. So we've covered here, we've gone here, we've gone here. And then the clinical trial developers are the people who are actually developing the clinical trial. And in a company, different companies are set up in different ways. So the question about who do we interact with is varied. It can be uh, the patient adv ad advocacy or in patient engagement department. Sometimes that's where we start. Sometimes that's not where we start. Um, sometimes it's clinical uh, development. Sometimes it's clinical operations. Um, uh, sometimes it's uh, the basic science part. It really depends on what's happening. And it mostly happens from connections that we have. Sometimes there are formal programs that companies and uh, investigators will reach out to. But the developer side of things in the yellow car here um, can be the actual investigators who are uh, creating the protocol. It can be, uh, and that can also include statisticians, protocol coordinators, uh, data management people, the uh, the whole team that actually develops the protocol itself. And then the protocol will go to the ethics board, which is at each institution. And that can be an academic institution, or there can be, a, a, sometimes there are nonprofits, sometimes they are for-profit uh, review boards. And they're looking at what happens, uh, what's being asked of patients and is, what level of risk is there? Is there a minimal risk to the patient in what we need to know? Have we thought through uh, giving people informed consent? If you've heard about informed consent, that's what the ethics boards are doing. Uh, and then we move over to the trial sites. So each trial site will be connected to some types of ethics board, whether it's their own institution or another one. And uh, we, uh, at the trial sites, that's where the clinicians, the physicians who are actually uh, certified to run that clinical trial, the nurses, the data managers, and everyone who's involved at the site to actually conduct the clinical trial. And they're the ones who talk with patients. And uh, if a patient joins a study, you look at the informed consent. 
uh, there's a whole consent process, but there is a form that has to be signed for that as well. And the whole idea behind informed consent is that uh, the patient receives the information about the study before they decide to join and uh, learns what, uh, what is happening in the study, what's expected. And I'm not going into a lot of detail on any of this. This is more of an overview of the roadmap itself. Uh, but we can go into detail in other webinars if, if we want to. Regulators are an important part of this whole process because in order to be, uh, to get a drug approved for a specific indication of that drug, in other words, how that drug can be used, that's where the regulators come in. So FDA is the Food and Drug Administration in the US. EMA is the European Medicines Agency in Europe. Uh, and there are other regulating agencies in different countries. Uh, Japan has one, China has one, lots of different countries have them. Uh, Canada has one as well. And they review the data from the clinical trials for these agents or devices, a device which could be like an MRI machine or imaging or some of the biomarkers are actually treated as devices. And those... Um, Regulators have to approve how that can be used, but it's really important to know that actually FDA, for instance, does not approve a drug. They approve how that drug can be used so that it can be commercialized and, and put on the market and used in clinics without a clinical trial. Uh, but there is something called off-label use, and off-label use is once the drug is out there, then doctors can determine how they want to use that drug. And as long as they can get it approved through insurance, uh, then that drug can be available and is available to many people, even though the label uh, might not include that. And then of course, patients enroll in clinical trials through clinical trial sites at this point. And families are a very big uh, factor in that and important in that any type of support system. It's not just family, it can be friends. Uh, whatever support system that patient has. A lot of times though in families and sometimes in communities like American Indian and Native American communities, it's more about the community approach than it is about the actual individual patient. So uh, it's important to make sure that we know that and that we're uh, planning for that in the clinical trial process. And then I also included standard setters. We didn't know exactly how to put this. Sometimes people say these are policy makers. But these are groups that actually try to help set standards, whether that's for data collection or for the, uh, sometimes you'll hear the term, quote, best practices, unquote. I don't use that because that usually ends up being some type of middle of the road practice. Um, and we want it to be a higher bar than that. But there are groups that are constantly looking at how do we make this better? What are guidelines that can be set for certain diseases and certain types of treatments or biomarkers and things like that? And a lot of that does exist in breast cancer. So those are the players. And I, I wanted to make sure that um, you understand that because of my background in looking at this from a patient perspective and working with actually thousands of patients through the last 20 plus years, um, that I have a dream. And the dream is that clinical trials are, are okay and we do get new treatments through them, but they can be so much better and so much more relevant to patient needs so that we can actually get better patient results. And I believe that there are ways to do that. We can analyze current trials and look at the results of those trials now that more of those are finally being shared with not only the trial participants, but with the public as well, to see what can we do better? What can we do better the next clinical trial that we have? What kind of patient questions could have been answered and need to be answered in the next one? And then what, what do we learn from the way that these drugs are actually being used? And how can we incorporate that into the new trials? And as patient advocates, of course, we can incorporate help uh, trial sponsors incorporate those lessons into new trials by coming up with better designs that make more sense from a patient standpoint as well as the scientific standpoints that have endpoints that make more sense and are more relevant that actually include better 
eligibility and better pharmacodynamics is what the PD is. That's how, how uh, the drugs are actually working in the body and how the body reacts uh, to that drug and, and may change things as well. And then the biomarkers. What we're learning is there's more and more uh, about the biology of cancer tumors that can be different. So, you know, in breast cancer, of course, we know about ER positive or negative, PR positive or negative, and HER2 positive or negative. There are lots more biomarkers that are uh, becoming more standard and uh, will be able to be used in the clinic. And so a lot of the new drugs are focused on the biology of the tumors. So not everybody will uh, benefit from that. Uh, and it's really important to know who will and who won't. So if we talk about patient engagement and how things need to change, and I'm glad to hear that uh, some uh, of our companies are trying to incorporate more patient voice, but uh, I agree with the comment that was made by the other patient advocate that we need to be there from the beginning because if we're taken care of first, I'm gonna kind of flip this around. Normally, Clinical uh, trial and product development has been focused on regulatory and product. Those are always taken care of because that's, that's what the sponsors are interested in. But if we flip this around and start with what's in this for patients and what do patients get out of this, what better results will they get out of it, then this can be a win-win for everybody. Uh, and if we start with design there, starting with the end in mind, which is how do we get better treatments to people, then the whole thing can flow better. And actually, uh, the clinical trials are running faster and better. There are fewer amendments, which are extremely uh, costly. So we can get clinical trials done more quickly uh, and less expensively, and hopefully then the patient communities can benefit with reasonably priced drugs as well. So I'm gonna switch now and talk a little bit about how we're involved. And the worlds of patient advocacy, everybody has a different thought about what patient advocates do. And of course, it starts with more of the traditional areas, which are listed here on the outside boxes of the puzzle, which Dana helped uh, put together for animating. Thank you, Dana. Um, it starts with direct patient support, which is the most accurate term for patient advocate, right? Where we're helping patients get through their experience, get the, the resources that they need, um, services, uh, sometimes treatments. There's political or lobbying uh, that can be done to make sure that we have laws and procedures and policies in order that actually help patients. Uh, there are fundraising that can be for research, it can be for patient services, it can be for lots of things. So some individuals and groups focus in these different areas. And then watchdog advocacy, which is more of what people think about for the AIDS movement, although there is some of that involved in cancer worlds and other diseases as well, where we're bringing issues and putting those on the table, shedding light on them so they have to be discussed. What we're gonna be talking about in the rest of the webinar here is research patient advocacy. And I don't call it research advocacy because we're not advocating for research. We're advocating for patients for better research so that we get better answers more quickly. And that's where this kind of started with PEAR, believe it or not, uh, back in the mid 90s. Uh, and then there are other groups that are involved in helping develop patient advocates for research. Uh, and that includes training, but it also includes opportunities. So we'll talk a little bit about that. So as patient advocates, one of the things that we do is keep centered in patient communities, understanding what's happening with people nowadays. And so what do patients want? Well, I'm going to start with what they don't want. And what we don't want are things that are only partial. Uh, we don't want things that uh, can possibly mislead. Uh, people into thinking that they have complete information when they don't. And we want, first of all, patients want to be people again. We start as people before our diagnoses, and then after we're diagnosed, we're relabeled as a patient, even though we feel like the same person, but we're treated differently and handled differently. And so really what we want to do is just be people again. That's not necessarily going to happen. So what we want are better treatments, not just more which is something that we get a lot uh, 
more, there have been a lot more drug approvals. I mean, sorry, not drug approvals, label approvals uh, in recent years. But if we don't know how to use them effectively, which the field often doesn't, then that's a problem. We want answers that we can use. And the last statement here is for my metastatic uh, friends, and I always have this in presentations, which is that we want answers that work for the people that we're testing this new uh, agent or device in. In other words, metastatic cancer patients do not want to be used as surrogates for earlier stage patients. They have their own needs and issues that are often not addressed in clinical trials, and we need to stop that. We need to make sure that uh, that the targeted audience and populations that are being involved in clinical trials have their own needs taken care of as well. So you, you guys have probably seen this uh, from time to time. This is a good graphic from the AIDS uh, community that explains kind of traditionally how clinical trials have been done. There are different phases of clinical trials that, that uh, start with phase one, which is like first in human or maybe a new indication for that preclinical is what's done in the laboratory to find out how does this drug work in both the lab and in some type of uh, animal models. And then it goes into people in phase one and continues through the process both for safety and for what's called efficacy, which by the way is not necessarily effectiveness in people, but it is something happening in the body that, uh, that seems to improve the, the process. And then there's FDA approved to look at what has happened in the clinical trial process. And then phase four clinical trials can be done, but that's after it's commercially used and is it available in the clinic and is paid for by insurance and by families. One of the things that's important to remember in the payment process is that patients and their families are payers as well. So uh, that's, a, that's a larger group. You can see here on this timeline, we've got uh, the process for development, and it goes through the planning and the protocol development process, uh, the approval process, which is the informed consent and the IRB and ethics approvals, the activation, which is how are we going to recruit patients to this? How do we get sites involved? Um, there's a, that's where the CROs and the vendors come in to help uh, sponsors identify who's going to be running this study or not. There's a recruitment or enrollment phase of the study. And then there's a weird word here that's not normally used called endurance. I'll explain that in a minute. And then the results of the study and how do we get that information out. The important part here, especially for our industry partners, is that this is normally called retention nowadays. It used to be called adherence or compliance because those are words that they use when they're talking to regulators and when they're trying to get uh, approvals. The problem with that is that they often wonder why aren't patients complying with our study or traditionally that's how things have been done. When in fact what this really is is an endurance test for patients and for trial participants. Whether or not you're in a clinical trial, it's an endurance test to get through treatment. And so the question then is as patient advocates, we try to bring in this element. This is just an example that words actually matter because they, it leads to mindsets that need to be changed. And so it's a lot different if you say, wow, how can patients endure this treatment as we're developing that protocol or that trial instead of why aren't they complying with us? So that just gives you an example of that. We help throughout this entire process and, and at the bottom are a few examples of things for instance, I used to chair a committee in one of the NCI clinical trial groups uh, where we actually uh, put some pilots together and did some different things uh, to try to help make those trials run more smoothly and uh, quicker. So um, also, by the way, feel free to, in the Q&A, go ahead and put those in. I'm gonna try to run through these slides pretty quickly so we are sure to have some time to have some discussions with the questions that you have. Um, and we'll open that up at the end. So there are also things that need to change. And the, the things that I'm bringing up here are things that are beginning to happen. There's lots of discussion right now with trial sponsors about how do we 
design the studies better in a way that adapts as we go. So within the clinical trial, as long as it's put in the protocol and it's statistically thought out very carefully, how do we make a design of a study so that there are, uh, so that we learn as we go and the study can actually change before uh, the end of the study? We learn what's working well, what isn't. We can change the arms of the study, who's enrolled in different arms. Platform studies are uh, usually include uh, multiple uh, arms or groups of patients within the study. And that can be by uh, product, by the, the agent that's being tested. That's called a basket study. It can be an umbrella study where there could be multiple uh, drugs and multiple sponsors of the clinical trial that are part of that. So there's a trial called iSpy2, for example, in breast cancer, uh, not in metastatic breast cancer, but in um, uh, other types of uh, earlier stages of breast cancer. And there are multiple companies that have uh, different agents that they're testing. And, we, uh, and that is an adaptive design trial to learn what's working and what isn't. So these can be faster, what's called go or no-go decisions for a company, for example, to know whether there's promise for this agent and it needs to go on to uh, a larger phase three study, for example, or not. There are decentralized clinical trials, and this is something that the uh, Metastatic Breast Cancer Alliance is working on, is how do we change studies so that it's more convenient for patients uh, getting more local sites involved, different procedural uh, methods that make it easier for patients to endure the, the study or the trial, where they don't have to travel um, even within the same city. If it's a big city, it can take an hour or more. If you're in a rural area, it can take you hours to get to a site. And if you have to have, if you uh, only have the main site where you can go to do your study visit or to, to do your follow-up, that can take up to an entire day's worth of travel sometimes, and that's ridiculous. So there are certain things like labs and things that could be decentralized, so we're working on that. And then there's technology, and this is something that companies are really excited about because they think that this is more ways to collect data from patients in different ways. So you hear about wearables, you know, are there things that you can do? Are there apps on your phone? How can we record data uh, for clinical trials through that so that we can get faster answers? The issue here is, and, and what I have here are two words that are important. These are clinical trial improvements that could benefit patients, but don't necessarily on their own. This is where we need to have a real voice in some of these things as well, because these can also be done in ways that will not help patients out. And I'm going to give you an example of that because data is one of the things that's really being talked about. RWD, you've probably heard that term. That means real world data, which is a tool it's just like a biospecimen that research can use to learn from. But in and of itself, it is not the answer. Um, and real world evidence, RWE, is something that is also used. That's where we analyze the data, the tool, and that can be used in medicine, it can be used in research, but that's still not the whole answer there. The, where we really wanna go is what I term RWA. And that's real world answers. How do we interpret that data and that evidence so that we can actually use it for better patient decisions? And um, often now with technology, a lot of people are beginning to feel like they're not only treated as if they are their disease, that they're treated as if they are the, a data repository rather than a person. So the point here is that when we're using technology and talking about data, we still need the with it, what's in it for patients. What are patients going to get out of this, both with that technology and with the answers that we need to provide for that? So you've seen this, uh, this timeline or this process of developing 
uh, new agents and, and devices for clinical trials. This is how we can get involved. And I mentioned this a little bit before, but in endpoints, there are patient relevant endpoints that can actually make a difference uh, not only in the approval process, because FDA is looking at this now as well, and other regulators are, but also in the reimbursement process, because the end goal is not the approval. It's actually, how do we get this out to the marketplace from a company standpoint, and how do they get reimbursed for that so that they make a profit? And as patients, we want companies to make reasonable profits because we want new drugs developed and we and we need those treatments so it is a partnership approach but we have to be there i'm going to talk just a little bit about the patient reported outcomes or otherwise wise known as pros in just a moment eligibility what's included who's who can be included in this particular study who's excluded from this study and why why is our most important question especially when we're talking about eligibility there are patient factors here that are important as well. So an example of this is the work that Alliance, uh, and the Metastatic Breast Cancer Alliance members are, are taking, uh, and there's an initiative on brain metastasis. Why in the world aren't we including patients with brain metastasis in a lot of studies? Well, it's because we've always kind of done it that way. And, and so the questions of why are we doing that? Is it truly valid for on a safety basis, not to include patients with brain mets on these studies, or can we include them because there are new factors, people are living longer, we have better treatments, et cetera, et cetera. So we need to learn again as we go, and we as the patient community can help bring that up. Procedures, local when possible, telehealth, especially in the days of COVID-19. I am kind of hoping that one of the benefits of this horrible experience that we're all sharing globally is that we can actually put into practice some of the changes that we've been pushing for for a long time in clinical trial and in research. And we certainly have the ability to talk about this because clinical trials are being discussed now publicly for COVID-19. We need to take advantage of that and move forward with the changes that need to be there. Um, and then results. What are patient relevant results? How do we finally get this information to people who have both been in trials as trial participants? Notice I'm not using the S word, subject, and there's a reason for that. I'm not even going to go into it on this webinar, but we can do that in a different uh, series if we want to. But plain language summaries that are health literate, that help people understand what was done in that study, what happened, and why that's important, and what that means to patients. So patient reported outcomes is something that's been around since the 1970s. Um, what they are are surveys, questionnaires. They've been primarily about adverse events in a clinical trial. What are the side effects that people may be having? Um, but we've had a problems getting more uh, patient reported outcomes integrated into clinical trials. And that's one of our goals as well as patient advocates. FDA has guidance on this and has since I think it was 2009 or before. That's like 11 years ago, everybody. And yet we still are having trouble getting PROs included in, in clinical trials. The reason that that's important is traditionally clinical trials have focused on what the clinicians were saying. There's something called COA, which is clinician reported outcomes, um, our outcome assessments. And um, that's great, but there have been many, many studies that have shown that what clinicians think are important to patients or our symptoms are not necessarily the same as what patients are actually experiencing. And so we need both. Uh, we need quality of life. It needs to be about more than uh, adverse events. It needs to include more of the patient experience and preferences as well. So this is an area that I think we, we can actually uh, have an impact on as well. And things are improving, so that's the good news, but we really need them uh, improved a lot. And we're having trouble, frankly, with NCI on this, uh, as well as some companies, although a lot of companies are trying to figure out how to do that. There have been uh, approvals, by the way, by regulators just focused on PROs. Uh, so that can happen if the drug isn't necessarily better than other treatments that are out there, but it helps 
lower side effects or it helps people function better in their lives, that's a, that can be a big win, especially in a metastatic setting. The other thing that's important to remember is that clinical trials don't answer everything for us. And we're getting shorter approval timeframes and cycles, but that leaves more questions for what is the long-term impact. What are the treatment regimens that are best for certain subgroups of patients who have these markers versus, uh, you know, XYZ markers versus ACQ or something like that? Um, so what are the best results and who is that going to really work for the best? There are a lot more conditional approvals because some of the drugs have a lot of toxicity, a lot of side effects. And so there's something called risk evaluation and mitigation strategies, which is actually a requirement sometimes that uh, regulators will make. And, uh, and we can be a part of that process as well. And then of course, real world data and studies uh, that collect patient needs and preferences be both before, during, and after studies. Uh, and that when we're partnering with sponsors to get better clinical trials done more quickly, then patient communities need to uh, benefit from that with uh, value, real value, what's going to really work for people, and that we pay reasonable prices for that. So context is one of the things I've been kind of talking about this whole time. Context is always missing for patients. And so for those of us, even those of us who are have been patients or are patients and are patient advocates involved in the process, we have to remember that we have a certain uh, view of this where we are helping to develop something that we think is really cool, but it doesn't work until the actual users get involved because it's a very different perspective and it actually can mean something totally different. And I love this cartoon because I think this really illustrates the difference between stakeholders and who's actually using it. And this is important, and the good news is I'm not gonna cover every word on this slide, but this is to bring up uh, an article that Patty Spears, who's an, a breast cancer patient advocate, and I wrote uh, in, a, in DIA forum, um, and so the reference is there, and, and Dana has that in the resources. Basically, what you need to, to know from this is that with the clinical trial development process here, which is at the top in the colored boxes, there are different levels of patient input from direct patients, patient groups, and then those of us that have gotten involved in the research process. All of that input is important at different times and at different levels to have a complete picture of what's going on for patients in that particular population or community. And um, so uh, some of us, who have been involved in this for a long time, try to help companies figure this out, put a game plan together that's actually going to meet the intention, which is to get better treatments to people more quickly. I have talked about this a few times, but financial toxicity actually, that term was actually created in the cancer world. And unfortunately, it exists on a daily basis. There are many patients and their families who are going bankrupt now again because of treatments. It is unsustainable for the costs that are involved, which is one reason why we can work together and be partners so that we get reasonable pricing for treatments. We want companies to succeed, but greed is, goes too far. And uh, then with that, we have one last polling question, and uh, Dana's going to bring up this poll. There are topics that are listed in the poll. You can answer as many of the topics as you would like to find out more information about these. So uh, if you would like more information about the types of clinical trials, both old and new, if you'd like to learn more about adaptive design and, and the way that that helps patients, uh, if you wanna know about the technology and data uh, collections, real world data and evidence that hopefully lead to real world answers. Remember RWA, we need to start sp spreading that around when you hear RWD and RWE. And uh, then decentralized clinical trials. So please check any of those boxes that you would like to learn more about. And we will have that poll result here in just a couple seconds. Okay, Dana, are we done?
Okay. Okay. So most people want to know about decentralizing clinical trials. The good news is there are lots of discussions about that with trial sponsors, and there are some pilots in all of these areas. So, but it looks like most everyone wants information about the new things, which is great because we can have an impact there as patient advocates and working together as partners. Okay, Dana, can you close that? I'm hoping that that did not close me out. Yay, okay. So now I'm sorry that it took uh, that long to get through everything, but we do have time for some questions. So uh, can we start maybe with Q&As that came in? Yeah, um, Deb, so one question, um, there, there's a whole series of questions. We'll try to get to as many as we can. Those that we run out of time answering, we'll um, answer after the fact and send them out to everybody along with the slides. So yes. first question is, Deb, you're involved with NCI. Do they require all NCI sponsored trials to have an advocate review? They don't require it, but they encourage that. And there are patient advocate teams with each of the groups that exist. So there are groups that used to be called cooperative groups. They're now a part of the NCTN. NCI clinical trial network and patient advocates in different types of cancers are involved on committees for each of those groups and are involved in the protocol development as well as uh, recruitment and, and uh, retention and results. Great. Um, next question. If one institution initiates a, um, a trial and adds on another institutional location, does each location have to approve the trial through their individual IRBs? Yes, so the way that IRBs work, there is something that's called a central IRB, uh, or some of the uh, for-profit IRBs. Um, if, if it's going to be run at a certain site, some type of ethics board has to look at it and approve it for that site to open it. So that can be done either by an institution so like an academic institution, for instance, I'm in the Bay Area. So UCSF has, they actually have several committees, but they have an IRB uh, department that looks at all of the research that's done through UCSF. Um, they also have, uh, for community practices, they might be part of that. They might be affiliated with an academic center, or they may have their own independent IRB, but it does have to be done for each site. Great. Um, next question, Deb. Uh, do the ethics boards have patient advocates? We, that's a great question. We have tried to get patient advocates involved in many IRBs. So I would say sometimes they do, sometimes they don't. They are required to have a community representative, quote unquote. Traditionally, that has been a retired doctor, lawyer, or a clergyman. So uh, we try to get more patient advocates involved in that process so that they can represent patient communities. Uh, but that needs to be broad because they cover everything, not just cancers. Great. Um, next question, where do trial drug manufacturers fit in with clinical trial roadmap? What car are they in? They are in, let me see if I can go back there. Uh, they are usually the funder or sponsor. They can also be the developers. Sometimes the developers uh, include academia or other outside um, investigators, but often it is uh, the sponsor is also the developer. Great, next question. Um, can you address progress um, about returning results of the clinical trial to patients? Um, aggregated data, of course. Yep. So uh, the um, returning results to uh, patients, the trial participants themselves, um, this is being done more and more, but not enough yet. And part of the reason for this, uh, I've been involved in this, believe it or not, since the late 90s. Uh, Companies are now beginning to create more plain language summaries because the EMA in Europe has a regulation that is requiring it that has not been implemented yet, but hopefully will be, well, maybe not this year now because of COVID, but we'll see. 
Um, the FDA has not made the same requirement, but we're hoping that they will in the near future and that companies will do it anyway since they have to do it for Europe. Um, there are two different types of trials. So there are aggregate trials. So in other words, a summary of the whole clinical trial and everybody that was a part of it so that we learn from that study. And then there are the individual trial results. Individual trial results are usually given by the clinical site that was there. Um, but, but there hasn't been a formal process. And what we're trying to do is make sure that everyone gets to see public results of every study that's done. I know I didn't give you a lot of detail on that, but I'd be happy to talk more about that because I've been one of the leaders there. Great, Deb, we're running close to uh, our hour time. So I'm gonna right. take one more, one last question. Um, how can we focus our clinical trial efforts away from doses defaulting to highest tolerated dose when that might not be the optimal dose and right. the quality of life issues associated with overdosing, if you could speak to that. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah, that'll take at least a whole hour. <laughs> um, okay, so there's something called MTD. Traditionally, that's uh, maximum tolerated dose, uh, was used in chemotherapy drugs, for example, because everything was dose-related. Nowadays, we have biological therapies and uh, immunotherapies and things that dose is not necessarily as important. So there's a dose limiting toxicity, DLT now. There's also, an, and maybe somebody can help me here, EBD, I believe it is, which is effective biological dose. So slowly but surely, we're changing to more accurate approaches and terminology. Um, overdosing has been an issue and that's one of the things as patient advocates involved in clinical trials we often question why are we always going toward the highest dose why aren't we going toward the most effective dose and how do we actually lower doses sometimes especially of chemotherapies to find out what is effective for the person rather than based on the amount that we're giving them so it's it's happening but it's spotty Great, thank you, Deb. I know there's a, um, a, a number of questions related to how um, and where can patients go to find out more about joining some of the industry patient engagement opportunities and how do the industry partners find their patients and is there diversity and um, across that's representative of the US population. So um, I think we're gonna take all of those um, and uh, work with our um, pharma partners to maybe come up with a summary sheet for each partner of where those resources are and what some of the guidelines. So we'll take that as a follow-up. Um, I'd like to thank everybody um, for your participation today. Uh, we'll take any questions that didn't get answered and try to do those as part of our um, follow-up to the call. So thank you all for attending. We hope you found the session to be educational and informative. Um, given today's chaotic upside down world we, uh, we're all living in, we greatly appreciate your taking time out of your day to join us. Um, I'd like to especially thank um, Deb Collier for um, her efforts and um, participating and um, working with us to develop this. Um, there will be additional resources that will, uh, it's a curated list of this topic um, along with the recording, um, which will be available on the Alliance YouTube, as I mentioned. Um, so look for something um, by end of day tomorrow from Dana. Um, with that, um, be safe, be well, be healthy, um, and uh, let us know how we can support you um, given everything that's going on in the world. Thank you so much for joining. Take care. Right. And feel free to contact me as well. But I, I will work with uh, Lori and Dana and uh, the firm of partners on putting those answers together. Thank you, Deb. Thank you, guys. Everybody be safe and sane.